I feel like so pampered. <laughs> this was really great. I would love to keep in touch with Cynthia. That's how Sylvia and I originally met. Sylvia knocked on the door and we said, great, we'll find a way with UN partnership help. <laughs> okay. Connected. <laughs> we will put you yes. all on one email and make sure that you're all yeah. connected. Standing by. There are solutions that are there, but it needs the bravery, it needs the courage, and it needs the boldness. We just wanted to make as much noise about it as possible. Leaders have to act on the promises they made in Paris. The SDGs are like a blueprint of what the needs of society are. Hello, and welcome to the SDG Roundtable on marking 75 years of human rights and civil society participation. This year is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a landmark document adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. The declaration recognizes the inherent dignity, equal and inalienable rights of all human beings and has become a cornerstone of international human rights law. The Declaration has played a vital role in promoting democracy and human rights around the world, and its principles continue to inspire individuals and communities to stand up for their rights to participate in democratic processes. As the United Nations Secretary General emphasized in his call to action for human rights, Society is stronger and more resilient when women and men can play a meaningful role in political, economic, and social life. Hence, an open, safe, and vibrant civic space is a key cornerstone for the realization of the right to participation. My name is Anne Marie, and I'm the Executive Director of the UN Office for Partnerships and the UN Democracy Fund. Joining me are four inspiring leaders. We have on screen Cynthia Ambamulu, Director of Programs of Yaga Africa, Sylvia Servaline, co-founder of Deliberia Brazil, Ian Walker, Executive Director of New Democracy, and Aleda Ferreira, UNDP Global Lead for Democratic Institutions and Processes. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Diving into the UN's role in promoting equal and inclusive safe participation, Aleda, the UN Secretary General was clear that resilient social contracts are not possible without open, safe, and vibrant civil spaces. Based on UNDP's multi-year experience and achievements, how do you think the UN can walk the talk in fostering the conditions for meaningful civic engagement? Thank you, Anne-Marie. I, I think uh, you are completely right. Without open, vibrant civil society, uh, social contracts can, cannot exist. And, and this in practice means that people have to have uh, the opportunity to, to have a say in what matters to them in their lives. And the UN system has been uh, very clear on this. Uh, I think we have a common approach, uh, approach that uh, can be summarized in three Ps, uh, prote protection, promotion, and partnerships. And this means that we need to work uh, with governments and they say actors to, to enhance that uh, participation, that, that, that engagement, but also work with civil society actors in all aspects of our work from policy engagement to actually implementation in the field. And for UNDP, uh, this is a, a, a key part of our work. And we do that in many different ways, from working with uh, advocates like human, uh, national human rights institutions, uh, providing guidance on freedom of expression, association, and also supporting governments and other institutions on, uh, on how to include uh, people in, in, in participation and, and political processes. Great, and we're gonna hear from our guests today different ways this is happening. But first, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
Let's hear from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk. Twenty twenty three is a milestone year for the cause of human rights, marking seventy five years since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This landmark text is transformative and timeless, offering solutions to some of humanity's most pressing challenges and a roadmap to a common future of dignity, freedom, and justice for all. As part of the UN Rights 75 initiative, which is led by my office, in May, we are shining a spotlight on civic space. Human rights can only be realized when people have open access to information, when they can freely express their views, when they are able to assemble and mobilize others offline and online, when they can participate in and contribute to decisions that affect them. We need a vibrant and open civic space for effective and transparent governance and institution building. To achieve progress on sustainable development, prevention and peace building, to ensure just transitions, to address the climate crisis. In this anniversary year, we need more forceful and united calls for safe and open civic space. One that is inclusive and celebrates diversity and that incorporates an age and gender sensitive approach. And one that recognizes the role of civil society actors, especially women, human rights defenders and journalists. I've called on member states to take concrete action on this issue this month and beyond, including through pledges at the Human Rights 75 high level event in December. Many thanks for organizing this vital discussion today, one that really sits at the heart of the human rights framework. I look forward to your recommendations. The High Commissioner has stressed that we need more forceful and united calls for safe and open civic space that is inclusive and celebrates diversity. Indeed, that is at the heart of the participatory approaches that we're discussing today. From your experiences in Nigeria, Cynthia, how are you working with youth in particular to be more empowered to be able to engage in political and decision-making processes? And how can technology facilitate their engagement given their familiarity with digital tools? Cynthia? Uh, yes, um, so for instance, Nigeria has um, a growing and a large youth population. And one of the things we've learned is that young people want to be part of the solution, they want to be heard. And in doing that, part of what we're doing is creating safe spaces for youth dialogue. And, because, and that is because um, when young people learn, they learn by doing, and by having conversations. So spaces for dialogue, leveraging deliberative democracy tools like People's Assembly. And so what People's Assembly does basically brings diverse youths to have conversations around policies. And whatever decisions come out from those deliberations would be used to engage government, to inform governmental actions. And I do believe it's important we start adopting deliberative democracy tools like People's Assembly. The second is supporting youth candidacy in elections. Why? We need to start having younger people in elective offices. And so one of the things we had achieved with the Naughty Young to Run in Nigeria, for instance, was to reduce the age to contest elections in office. But we need to go beyond that. So things like affirmative action for youth representation in elective offices that ensures that young people contest and win elections. So things like capacity development for young politicians, young people transiting from student unionism into mainstream politics, or just young people from moving from civil society engagement to mainstream in politics, so building their capacities to contest for office and to engage within political parties to demand for issues and policies that would influence, that would inform and influence um, issues that affect youth, young people. And I think the last point for me is leveraging social media. Technology is a huge tool for, for youth engagement, and I think it's, begin, it's beginning to change the discourse on how we engage in Nigeria and in Africa. I'm excited to explore that a little bit more. We're going to hear from the other guests, and then I'm going to ask everyone to kind of jump in with us. One of the fundamental aspirations of the Declaration is the right to participate in government and democratic processes. In line with this, the New Democracy Foundation, together with the UN Democracy Fund, supported a citizens' assembly project in Brazil, among other countries. Sylvia, what can we learn from participatory approaches in Brazil and innovative approaches that can inspire others, like Cynthia has just explained? 
Thank you, Anne-Marie. Yes, first I'd like to say that Brazil, Brazil the, the, our constitution, also known as citizens' constitution, led to the creation of impressive uh, set of participatory instances, such as national conferences, state and municipal councils, and participatory, the famous participatory budgeting. Uh, so, the, although this is a lot of achievement and uh, we have a legacy, uh, participation really needs a significant and constant effort to become really universal. So, I'd like uh, our experiences with citizen assemblies in Brazil, including the Citizen Council of Fortaleza that you mentioned, supported by UNDEF and in partnership with New Democracy Foundation, uh, and also virtual mini publics that we have run during the pandemic demonstrated the benefits of three differentiators of this innovative participatory approach. Like, I'd like to say something about them. First, sortition and civic lottery. Coupled with providing material support to participants, it contributes to make concrete advances for inclusion and diversity. Second, the informative pillar. Uh, before starting a citizen assembly, public officials, experts, activists, need to do a homework. They need to lay out what are the difficult questions and choices to be made. Working on visions for the future or offering preliminary alternative scenarios, for example, enables participants to deliberate with a strategic and integrated view. This helps to place citizenship in the center of political decision. Finally, there is deliberation and considered judgment. In our experiences, we repeatedly witness what we have called citizen mode being activated, which means when different people work together to figure out the best possible solution for the common good, even in contexts so polarized as ours. So participation cannot be taken for granted in such an unequal world. We have to keep working on it. Thank you. Sylvia, thank you so much. I just got little goosebumps when you said citizen mode and you were explaining how that works. Um, Ian, I'd love for you to jump in and explain how these citizens and people assemblies contribute to the aspiration of human rights. I think they're right on the, at the centre of the aspiration for human rights, which, as Alita said, is we all want to have a say in the decisions which affect us. As citizens' assemblies are simply, we're finding a better way to do this. Citizens' assemblies are simply one more step to rounding out that role. Now, there's really three reasons for this. One is it's a great chance to mix. You know, we get people from all walks of life. We put them in one room, old and young, white collar, blue collar, you know, rich and poor, put them in the one room and see what we can agree with in an environment that increasingly silos us and, and sort of emphasises what we can't agree with. And that's one transformative change. The second is that these are pragmatic. They bolt on. We have our electoral democracy and people in elected office find it complimentary, find it useful. You know, th there's a lot of reasons sometimes to protest against a system, but pragmatically, you want things that operate and, and can simply be added to many different democratic contexts. And lastly, the real hope for citizens' assemblies for me is that we see this surging misinformation problem and it's going to be much easier to build a public judgment mechanism than it is going to be to try to remove uh, misinformation from public opinion environments. So when we think about that big looming problem, citizens' assemblies, simply put, they're working. And we're seeing interest from all around the world in saying, hey, how can we do the next one? And as Sylvia noted, we appreciate partnerships with the UN to help make that happen and take them into ever new countries. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, something you said that uh, what, that was echoed with all of our guests right now is building trust. I mean, in this time where when we mix technology and social media and information and misinformation, disinformation travel really fast, um, building trust and finding common ground is, is something to be celebrated. And maybe I could ask each of you to maybe jump in here and just talk a little bit about what you've seen on the trust building side or maybe some of the challenges that you're looking ahead to that you're hoping that um, citizens' assemblies and processes like that can help us going into the future. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the things we're learning is, um, so I'll use the Nigerian context, for example, where we have a lot of 
young people who want to participate but do not know how to participate, one. The second is huge mistrust or distrust with the system. So one of the things we started to do was to invest in peer-to-peer -peer mobilization. So we call it the Power of 18 Initiative, where young people share innovative ideas on how they will leverage technology to mobilize their peers. And then they are given a small seed support to mobilize their peers. And whatever they do, is what informs the conversation. So basically, promoting electoral participation, but young people driving the conversation for their peers to be part of the system. I think, and young people trust young people than having older generations mobilize them. So I believe that peer-to-peer -peer engagement is one of the tools in building trust within the system, especially in a country like Nigeria, where there is huge um, trust deficit with citizens and government relations. Alita, do you want to jump in here? Does this resonate with you? Yes. Uh, I, well, I think here, for me, uh, this, there is two aspects. On one, on one hand, we really need to ensure that it is, in order to be meaningful, is inclusive. And, and inclusive meaning for everyone. So we really need to ensure to take the barriers to, to, to that, that affect especially some groups to participate. And the other part is the use of technology in a way that is del deliberate inclusive. Because we, what we see is that sometimes those uh, technologies are excluding some, some groups as part of, of the public debate. So I think that's um, something that we really need to, to pay special attention. Thank you. And, and Sylvia, you said it's, it's like a muscle that you need to keep using um, because otherwise it can, it has to before it can become embedded and become second nature. Um, what are you looking forward to in the future as you continue to grow this idea? Well, um, we've, been, we've been seeing and experiencing this. Uh, we are talking about trust. And I'd like to say that um, we start any experience First, inviting leadership, political leadership, to trust people. Because it's not only the mistrust from people to the government, but also on the other way. So if the it's not bureaucratic, if it's a participatory process that is not bureaucratic, leadership will trust people to give the best answers. So it, is, it makes very sincere and, and, and good questions for the citizen assembly. This is the first step. And we are building even methodologies to do this process because the, the good question is a first step for, for success and uh, with distrust. And then when you trust people, they feel it because they, the mayor, the city councilor gets there and tell them, I need your help to solve this, please. They put the, tape, the cards on the table and people really feel they are responsible. And also with the sortition and then the inclusiveness and uh, the diversity that we, get, we have in the room, they feel that they are a group. They have the responsibility because they, they have to do things thinking about people who are not in the room. And this is the magic of the sitting mode. They are not thinking about their individual interests or their preference. They are thinking what's the best for everybody. And uh, so we, uh, the next steps, I think I've said that uh, I think seats and assemblies need to be popular. Like they need to be known, uh, have awareness from the general public to be uh, celebrated, as you said, and Mahi, I think we have to celebrate this exercise. They are wonderful and they need to be everywhere. And everybody, our aspiration is that one day, everybody will think that, oh, I hope I be uh, selected in dissertation to participate. <laughs> That's our vision. That's a wonderful vision. And Ian, wrap us up here. What, you're hearing a lot of um, the different ideas and around how this is moving um, and creating civic space and protecting civic space. Your thoughts? Trust is the great word because you really start from a point of who do we trust? You look at every global survey. We all tend to trust people a bit like ourselves. And yet when you look at parliaments, they seem like people living in a remote and different world. And I think in projects we've seen everywhere, it's just that identification where people could look up and see someone 
roughly with a life experience like them that's fallen away a little bit in our just traditional electoral democracies alone. And really only the second point on trust that I really like and want to bring out, Ireland has really been a pioneer and a leader in this area. And one of the things they did in, in one of their earliest projects was they put randomly selected people and MPs in the same process. Imagine that, spending 60, 80, 90 hours together. And it, it alludes to Sylvia's point, two-way trust building, because you're not going to get millions of people to trust politicians. But if, but if 50 or 100 in the room and say we spend a lot of time with them and these seem like actually okay people, we're going to rebuild trust in electoral democracy as well. And picking up Sylvia's point, it's really important for politicians to have that long interaction with these people. And we always see this absolute breakthrough of, wow, they took that really seriously and really work to actually find agreement when politicians are very used to people coming to them emphasising disagreement. And I think that's where we're going to get a more trusted, cohesive society. Well, thank you so much, because this is a truly a timely reminder of what the human family agreed and codified 75 years ago as Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to take part in the government of his or her country. Before we close, I would like to ask each of you to share one word that captures how you're feeling as we move forward. Sylvia, let me start with you. Uh, collective. <laughs> That's a great word. Thank you, Sylvia. Cynthia, what's your word? Dialogue. Collective dialogue. Ian? Innovative. Wonderful. And Alita? Inclusion. Inclusion. What a wonderful word to end on. I want to thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. You can find more information about the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by clicking on the link below and learn more about Citizens Assemblies. Thank you so much and we'll join you next time.